Good morning, everyone. Welcome to North Raleigh Christian Church. If you'll go ahead and stand with us, we're going to worship the Lord together this morning. How's everybody doing? Everybody feeling good? Excited to be in the presence of the Lord this morning? All right, Lord, we worship you. We praise you. We welcome you into this place, God. We ask that you would come and have your way here this morning, Lord. We praise you, God. Praise you, Lord. How we doing today? 
Welcome to North Raleigh Christian Church, where it is our mission to help you find your purpose through following Jesus. We are glad that you would join us on this dreary, rainy Sunday, but we're going to praise the Lord, and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be like sunny sun, summer weather in here. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I'm Nick. I'm one of the elders. Um, uh, if this is your first time, welcome. We want to make sure that we get any information about you so that we can uh, tell you about who we are and what we're all about. Make sure you fill out that Connect card that's in the seat back in front of you. If you've been coming here a few times, we don't think that, you know, hey, you can get to know us by coming once, twice. We really encourage you to try five. I think it takes a few times before you get to know a church and know this is really the place that uh, I'm supposed to be at or not be at. And we want to make sure that we find a place where you can go and you can worship the Lord. Um, so make sure you try five. If you're going through that journey, let um, uh, somebody at the front table know. Um, let one of the pastors or elders know. We would love uh, to help you walk through that journey. Um, our church is all about family. These people, the people that are here, are like brothers and sisters to me. And one of the ways that we hang out as family is we go to a baseball game. It's going to be pretty fun, right? So sports, go sports. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so on uh, June 25th, we are going to the Durham Bulls. Uh, you should have gotten an email in your uh, midweek update. Uh, that has a link so that you can buy tickets to that. We're going to be going together as a group so that we can go watch the Durham Bulls hopefully uh, uh, win that day. Um, uh, so make sure you sign up for that. There's limited seats and tickets available, so make sure you do that. Um, let me pray over us and let's continue in worship today. Um, Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for being our Lord. Thank you for watching over us, for giving us um, a purpose in our lives, Lord. Um, help us to glorify you and today learn more and more about who you are and what you're supposed to be doing in our lives. We ask these things in your name. Amen. How is everybody doing this morning? You doing good? Are y'all ready to enter into the presence of our God? He tells us to enter into his gates with thanksgiving in our heart and enter into his courts with praise. So we're going to continue to praise him this morning. But I want to encourage you just to begin to have a heart of thanksgiving towards our God. Let's begin to thank him for who he is, for what he's done for us, for what his word tells us that he will do. Amen. Let's continue to stand on the promises of our God this morning. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, God. We thank you, God. You are a good God. You are loving and kind. You are faithful. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. You never leave us. You never forsake us, God. We thank you, Lord, that you make a way for us to know you, God. We praise you, Jesus. Let's worship him. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that stood in our way. But he came, he died, and he rose. Those walls are up. Let's sing together. Remember those giants? Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. are dead. How many of you are thankful for that this morning? Come on, let's see it. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. So let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God. King Jesus. That fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper And now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness Never was Thank you, Lord. 
morning, let's sing it. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Sing, you take, you take what the enemy continue to call upon the name of the Lord this morning. That is where our peace is found. That is where our joy comes from, our strength, our hope. It's in you, Jesus. So we call upon you, Jesus. Come and have your way. Come and speak to us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hey, how's everybody going? How's everybody going? How's everybody doing? Where are we going? Yeah, all right. It's good to see you guys. You all get the gold star for coming to church on the holiday weekend. Uh, the rest of people who went someplace, we love them too, because you're watching online and just know it. I'm just going to pretend that's true. So hey, it's good. Hey, we are in the last week of our series and going through Romans, and I hope that you've enjoyed this journey through this book of Romans, as we've been in it for the last three months and really just dove into what is it that God said as through this letter that was written to this church in the ancient city of Rome. Now, if you remember, and if you don't, that's fine, we'll remind everyone through throughout the year, our theme of teaching for this year is simply this, holy living in a broken world. 
So how do we learn to live a holy life in a world that is broken, that is full of temptation and desires and draws that pull us away from the truths of Jesus? So, so that's where we're going with everything that we do this, this week or this month or this year. And, and we're going to start a new series next week. Do you want to know what it is? Yeah. I'm not telling you. Okay, I'll tell you. We're doing, we're doing Ephesians. We're going to do right. hey, Ephesians. Yes. Paul's letters. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do books of the Bible twice uh, back to back. Usually we don't do that, but uh, just fit right as we're learning to live a holy life in a broken world. And so uh, one of the main ways that our holiness and I guess our attempt of living a holy life is, is thwarted or is broken or is hindered is by how and who we choose to do life with or who we choose to do life with. We can choose to put people in our inner circles in our lives that can draw us close to Jesus or they can drag us away and push us away and put obstacles in our paths. It's like the old ancient proverb says, you know, you can pick your friends, you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your friend's nose, right? Uh, it has nothing to do with this message. I just always want to say it in a sermon if I finally got there, right? But when I was in sixth grade, I, my best friend was a, was a kid named, named Dennis. Now, we weren't bad kids apart, we were fine. We were respectful. We had good family lives. It was great when we weren't together. It was just like when we got in the same room and we, and we, we hung out together, it was like our forces joined to unite in this, this super mega thing of doom. You know, that's just who we became and what we did when we were together. We were just absolute terrors, and it was awesome, right? I, I remember one particular day, we were at, at class in Lincoln Elementary School in Jackson, Tennessee, which... Uh, Lincoln Elementary was in the worst part of the city and, and was, a, was a very run-down and dilapidated school, but, but that's where we went. And, and, and we were there, and we decided that, that in our sixth grade class, which we had already started, we didn't want to be there anymore. And so it's like, let's just skip class. Okay, you can't skip class when you've already been there, right? They know. And so we were in there, but we were, in, we were 12. We didn't know. And so we decided we we're going to skip class. Like, okay, where are we going to go? Let's go downstairs to the basement to the boiler room. Now, I don't know if you know much about West Tennessee. If you think North Carolina cockroaches are large, they are nothing compared to West Tennessee megasauruses. You know, they are ginormous. They're, I promise you, they're, they're two inches long. Sometimes they get to three inches and they fly. Do you ever seen a cockroach that flow? Oh, crazy. They fly here? I don't know. Okay, whatever. And so we go down, we, we sneak away. I think we went to the bathroom, you know, it was class bathroom time or art. And we just kind of like peeled off and went down this, this stairwell and we went to the boiler room. And when we opened the door and turned on the light, it was some sort of, uh, of weird uh, hybrid uh, Harry Potter of the rings, you know, uh, George Clooney, I, I don't know. But there were cockroaches everywhere and then when we turned on the light they just all got scared and they didn't run away they flew oh. front row does not like cockroaches <laughs> one bit right and so these cockroaches they just flew just and you heard their wings just everywhere and so we just shut the door and like okay we can't go in there we can't go in there so where are we going to go but we noticed that the stairwell that went down to the the basement and our, our building, our school building was a one floor building where all the classrooms were. It went up. And I was like, oh, does that go to the roof? And so we go up the stairs and lo and behold, there's a, a door and we open the door and it goes out on the roof and we were in 12 year old heaven. We went out and we just went out on the roof. Now we weren't bad, we weren't vandalizing. We were just running around. Now we just like two 12 year olds on the roof of their school in the middle of the day just running back and forth right above the heads of classrooms. So this teacher teaching about science, you know, talking about, and the earth rotates and just, that's what was happening. And so I don't know how long we were up there. We were just running around doing little boy things, you know, it was funny. And, and I remember it's like, we should probably go down. We're gonna get, someone's gonna see us. And as soon as I said that, we turned to the door and the door opened and out walked the police officer. And then out walked the second police officer. And then out walked the assistant principal. And then out walked the principal. You remember how they told you in school, remember how to spell principal, like the principal school? Yeah. Principal is your pal. He was not our pal that day. <laughs> he was not in any mood for our foolishness, and we got in some pretty big trouble. And then after that, for whatever reason, my parents didn't let me hang out with Dennis anymore. I know. Just think of all the fun we would have had, right? But as we close up Romans, 
Paul, he gives us his final greetings here. And in his final greeting, he acknowledges people in, in his life and people who meant a lot to him who were in that church of Rome. They had, they had migrated to the city and they were there for certain reasons or maybe they're on their way there and they just hadn't gotten there wet yet, but Paul knew that. And so Paul, he acknowledges some of these people. And it's a section of scripture that we often read over, but it's something that I think we can learn a whole lot from. And then he's after he's, he's done addressing these people, he kind of gives us a last bit of instruction on how to interact and specifically how to interact with those in the church who may not be up to, to any good. And so we're going to try to go through 20, 21 verses of this chapter and we're going to get through it and it'll be good. And so, so I hope that you're ready to go. So y'all ready to go into Romans today? Yeah. All right. Now, let me go and tell you, if you're here today and you do not have a Bible, just go out those doors and turn left when service is over, go to the welcome desk and I, the new Bibles finally came in, y'all. We have like loads of them, so just grab one. Would love to give that to you as our gift from us to you. So, so as we get started in our pas passage with Romans today, I want us to grasp this statement. Who we choose to do life with makes a difference in our holiness. Okay, who we choose to do life with makes a difference in our holiness. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have friends who do not know Jesus. We absolutely should. If we do not have people in our lives and everyone, like everyone in our life are Christians, we don't have anyone in our life who doesn't know Jesus that we can, we, you know, we have a relationship with, we're doing life wrong, okay? We need to have people who do not know Jesus in our lives who we call our friends, but who we choose to let in to our inner circle who we choose to listen to wisdom from through life, who we choose to follow and to, to help guide us in the direction of our soul and direction of our life, that needs to be the right person. That needs to be a follower of Jesus. And this isn't anything new. You know, this is the stuff that we were taught when we were 12 years old about how to pick our friends at school, right? Don't give in to peer pressure, you know, you'll do drugs. You know, that's how we were taught all the time, whatever. And we did, but it's anyway. But don't be like that. We have to be careful. On the other hand, we can choose to put people in our lives who build us up and who direct us toward God, who help us take steps toward Jesus. And when we choose to do that, uh, it changes everything about us. It's so encouraging and so powerful, and, and we have someone who, who cares about us. So look at verses 1 and 2, and Paul, he just, he just starts writing about his friends and the people that he knows. He says this. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church of Centre, and that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. And so here we have Phoebe, this, this lady, this, this servant. She would have been a Gentile by birth and because she was named after the, the Greek god uh, Apollo, uh, the Greek mythology. He was the, the, I guess he wasn't a god, he was a, a messenger of, of the gods. Phoebus was another name for Apollo, and that's what she was named after. So she wasn't a Jewish lady, she was a Greek. And Paul commended her to the church, meaning, look, this lady is coming to you, and she has done a lot of good, and she is highly recommended. And so what she is bringing to you you need to receive what she is going to tell you you need to receive what she is going to to give from me to you you need to receive because she is a a special servant and the servant the the word that is used here is the word diakonos which is where we get the word deacon from in english she was a deacon of this church of century which was near corinth where paul was at this time and most likely she was either coming to prepare the way for paul like she has a message to, to give to to the church before Paul gets there, or she's bringing an offering from the church in Jerusalem. So we go into verses three, four, and five. It says, Great Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Think of that reputation. Verse five starts with, Greet also the church in their house. Prisca, or Priscilla, as she's known in Acts, and her husband, Aquila, they're two of my absolute favorite people that we read about in Scripture. I'm actually working on the prelims of a sermon series of just about their lives and what we can learn and apply uh, from their lives to ours. I just love this married couple. And so you have Priscilla and Aquila, and they put themselves in danger to keep Paul safe. You can probably in the city of Ephesus, and we read about that in Acts 19. But we see now that they're in Rome, but they're not just there. They're not just there working. They're leading a church in their home. 
They started a church. You see, in the New Testament times, there were no church buildings at this point. And there's debates of when the first church building was. It could be 100 years after this or maybe 300 years or any time in between. But there were, no, there were no church buildings at this time. And so the church met wherever they could. They met in houses. They met in the temples of the Greek gods and goddesses. They met in the, the synagogue courtyards. They met by the river. They met anywhere they could possibly meet. And that was where the church was. See, what we need to understand is the church is never ever a building it's the people and so when we say i'm going to church we're going to come together this pile of brick and mortar which one day will not be here anymore uh, this isn't building isn't the church we are and so when we think of anything church we should be thinking of uh, of people not of a property and so greet also the church and their house. And verse five goes on. And greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. This is the only time that he was mentioned in the, the Bible. And, and I think he's just put in here because it's special. Paul remembered this first convert of his work in, in the region of Asia. And he was, he was excited and proud. And this guy had gone there. And you, you never forget the first person. I, I still remember mine in 2000 in Louisville, Kentucky at Fern Creek Christian Church. And I remember everything about that day. And it's something, church, that every single one of us is called to experience. And that is leading someone else to Jesus. It's like, well, I haven't done that yet. Well, you need to. Because the command in the Great Commission, what we see in Matthew 28, the last thing that Jesus said was to go therefore in all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching people everything that he has commanded. That was for all of us. So every single one of us, it is our job, our responsibility to share Jesus with the people in our lives. And so the question I want to ask is simply this. Who is in your life that you have the opportunity to share Jesus with? Who do you work with? Who do you go to school with? Who is in your house down the hall? Who's sleeping in the bed next to you maybe even? Who do you know and who do you have that you need to share Jesus with? And so are you doing that? And if you haven't, we can't change that. Well, what are you going to do? And that's a challenge. And if you're not sure exactly how to work this or, or, or where to go with that, come and talk to me. I'll, I'll be more than happy to, to give some pointers. I'm, I'll even meet with somebody with you. It'll be fun. There's wings involved. It's great. It's good. We'll, we'll do that. Verse 6, it goes on. It says, greet Mary who has worked hard for you. Now, this Mary is not the mother of Jesus, Mary. It's a lady who is, who is steady and faithful and dependable and selfless. Someone who was in the church and served every chance she possibly could. She served others in all kinds of different ways. And she was always at work and she was always serving and always, always doing things. She worked hard for the people in this church. And I think from this verse, we can get a simple challenge from this. We need to strive to be burden lifters, not burden givers. Okay, look, there are seasons of life when life gets really hard or when, when money runs out or when we lose a job or when our kids are crazy or when our parents are, are fighting and we think we're gonna split up where, where we need to be a burden, for lack of a better word, we need help. And as a church, we're called to, to do that. And we're called to step into people's lives and to give of ourselves over and over and over to, to help those who, who need help, right? But we should strive to get out of that situation as best we can. And strive to become a people who help lift each other's burdens. And when we don't have to, we're not giving burdens to others. Because we understand there are times in life when things get really, really hard. But we also know this. If we're honest, and we're, we're being, this is church, we're gathered, we're honest, right? I think if I said, raise your hand if you've ever had a season where you were a burden to others, we'd all put it up, right? You don't have to do that. We, we, because everyone's in this boat. We've all been there. And so there are times when that happens. And if you say, ah, not me, well, especially you, right? <laughs> but let us be encouraged to work hard and serve each other. Verse 7, greet, greet Andronicus, which I love that name. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles 
and they were in Christ before me. Now, not exactly who these two were and two are. Uh, scholars debate that. Many believe that they were a married couple, as uh, the name Junia could be both male or, or female in that uh, environment, kind of like uh, what's the name that we have in our culture that can be a, both a boy's name and a girl's name? Stan. Okay, like a name like that. <laughs> but whoever they were, they were kinsmen, which means they were also were Jews, and they were a big help in the early church. And all the apostles knew about them. Now, I want to let you in on a little, little preacher secret. All right, we're just letting everyone in. Everything's open. Preachers talk about the people in their churches. If it's bad, we never say names. Ever, ever, ever. And it's usually like, hey, what do I do in this situation? I need help. I don't know what to do. Right? But we love to talk about the awesome. And so when I get together preachers, I name names. I've got this person named I was, you're there. I have this elder named Scott and his wife Lori who are awesome and they teach classes and their just hearts are for discipleship. And, and I do this mainly because the other preacher's like, whoa, I wish I had that. So like, yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. You know, and, and so that happens. But that is exactly, look, that is exactly what happened here. You know, the, the whole church, they, they, they knew of them, and, and he, was, he was bragging of them. They're well known to the apostles. And so the apostles that were spread all around the Mediterranean rim, they knew of this couple, or they knew of these two people. And like, wow, we heard of these stories. How do we develop someone like that in these congregations that we're at? It's so encouraging because there was such a big help to the early church that all the apostles knew of them. So may we strive to be that as well. In verses 8 through the start of 10, it, it goes on and he, and he says, Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. And my beloved Stachys, greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Now, the first three we, we know very little about. But the word beloved was a word in the, the Greek language that was used as a parent to describe the love of a child. So most likely, Paul had led these three to Christ, and they had ended up in, in, in Rome. And it's a word of just straight endearment and of compassion. And so beloved that Paul made a point to mention them. Say hi to me for the, will you say hi to them for me? Will you, will you, will you please tell them that I was thinking about them and I was talking about them? And Pilatus and Urbanus, they were, were common slave names. Stachys was possibly a doctor, maybe a slave who was captured, who at one time was a doctor, but he, he worked in, in some sort of field like that. And we know this through archaeology. His name has been found in inscriptions uh, speaking of him. And so he was either just a, a regular doctor from Rome or he was a doctor who was a, a slave as well. But Apelles, this is where it's going to get a little real. Apelles was a very common name, uh, like in our culture, John. It was a very common name. Uh, it's, everyone, it was one of the most popular names of the time. And we do not know anything about him except the phrase, who is approved in Christ. The phrase it was worded in such a way in the, the original language that it describes the approved in Christ as someone who has gone through the worst situations and is still hanging on. And so, so Paul mentioned him. Look, there you have this guy in this church. Make sure you say hi to him because he has been through so much and yet here he still is. Yet here he is in the church loving Jesus and yet here he still is and, and whatever he went through was so bad and so hard and, and he was so, so testing but he was, had, had been through so much but he was just, just hanging in there and just holding on to the line. And some of us get that today because we've been through a lot. And some of us get that today because we're just holding on to that knot at the end of the rope and we're not sure just how much we are. And I wonder when Apelles heard this, he was like, wow, Paul, remembered me? Maybe that helped him climb up that rope a little more. But he had gone through so much. And this phrase is that tells us that no matter what Apelles went through when he came across, he stayed with Jesus and nothing could take him away. And, and I love these names. I love that they were included like this. And I think... 
us taking a look and, and taking time to look at all these individual stories as they are in the story of God, just like our individual stories are in the story of God. I think as we look at these, we can see where Scripture teaches us a very, very important lesson that sometimes we gloss over and we forget. You see, our social status, our sinful past, our difficult seasons of life do not keep us from being desired by Jesus. It doesn't keep us from being desired of Jesus. You've had, so far we've had slaves, we've had a doctor, we've had, had Jews, we've had, had Gentiles still desired by Jesus. We've had people who made mistakes, people who had pasts desired by Jesus. Verse 10 goes on and says, greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Uh, uh, a recent study about uh, church attendance and, and students when they grew up and uh, just went on their own and, and went to college and, and just were living life. Uh, it talked about the, their church, future church attendance. Um, well, a lot of it was, was based and affected by their parents, especially by dads. You see, when children attend church alone, only 6% continue to attend as an adult. So if we have kids that come to youth group by themselves, <laughs> there's only a 6% chance that they will stay in church after they leave home. And look, I was a, a student, student pastor in a church with a large youth group where a large portion of the kids were unchurched and their parents didn't come to church. That's, that statistic is true. That statistic is true. You see, when, when only mom attends, it, it jumps up a little bit. It says when mom attends, only 15% of children continued as an adult. When dad attends, 55% continued as an adult. And so dad getting involved uh, raises it up a lot. But when both mom and dad attend church, the children have a 72% chance of attending church when they're out of the house. And so we see this, the family of Aristobulus, and we see that here we have this family that is serving and working in, in the church. And so we under, have to understand something. The best chance for our children to remain in Jesus is to follow him together. The best chance is for us to follow him together. Now, now what happens while well, I'm, I'm a single mom, I'm a single dad? Well, guess what that means? Us as a church, we have to work that much harder together to help with the, the children and with the mom or with the dad. We can't let them do this by themselves. We have to be just, just how do, do you need rides to school? Oh, you, you have to work and you can't make your son's game. Guess what? I'm going to be there. You know, all of those things that we have to all participate in that type of thing. And that's what was happening uh, in, in this church. We have to be ready. Amen. Verse 11 goes on. It says, greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Now here, these two names, these two names had some major clout. These two names had some major recognition. Herodian was a Jew from the family of King Herod. When he became Christian, a Christian, he would have walked away from being part of a royal family to follow Jesus. He gave up his status, he gave up his wealth, he gave up all of the things that he had, all of his privilege to, to follow Jesus. And it's interesting, he would have done that in Jerusalem. And he's like, well, where am I gonna go? I'll travel to Rome, to the big city. Maybe I can find peace there, or find a place, or find work, or find a job. And, and he got involved in this church. He gave up everything. Narcissus was a very wealthy and powerful man in, in the Roman government. And just three years before uh, this letter was written, the Roman emperor Nero, uh, Narcissus and Nero had some sort of falling out and some sort of disagreement. And so Nero said, look, the best thing for you to do for your family and for you is for you to commit suicide. And so that's what Narcissus did. And so here you have the family of Narcissus in the church of Rome who just went through amazing tragedy. And here they are in this church belonging to this family. And yet through it all, they served and they served and they served. You see, church, our life experiences will either lead us to a greater level of service and devotion to Jesus, or we can allow them to pull us away. The choice is ours. Hard times and difficult seasons and tragedy, they're gonna come to all of us, right? 
They're, that's life. Is that the way out of design life to be? Of course not. But that's the way it is. And so we get to make the choice when tragedy hits, is this going to pull me closer and draw me closer to God? Or I'm going to allow this to just affect my faith and I'm just going to just get up and I'm just going to walk away from this. You see, Narciss' family and then Herodian, they had every reason to be angry at God and to walk away, but they didn't. They got closer. And so we have a choice to make as well. Verse 12 goes on and says, Greet those workers in the Lord, Trifina and Trifosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Now, Trifina and Trifosa were sisters that may have been twins. Great names for twins, right? You know, moms, if you're ready for twins, there you go. Uh, I went to school with a set of twins. Their names were Champagne and Champelle. I don't want to know why they got that name, but they did. All right, so just the way it was, all right? But imagine serving Jesus with your adult sister or adult brother. Like you're in the same church and you're working together together and you're serving together, and you're attending together. And we have that with teenagers. You know, we have, we have siblings in all areas of our church serving. But how amazing is that with adult sisters serving? And then you have Persis, who worked hard in the Lord, and we do not know much about him other than Persis was a female name of a slave. You have another slave. Verse 13 says, greet Rufus, great name. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also, look, his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. I mean, I, I think Rufus is a name we should bring back. You know, we got pregnant ladies in the church, so if y'all name your kid Rufus, I will give you a dollar, right? <laughs> if you name your kid Rufus Justin, five dollars, okay? I mean, it's just the way it is. But Rufus was also a slave name, but not just any slave name. It was a slave name that was given to boys with red hair. So we know he was a red-haired slave. Had a lot against him, I guess. I don't know. Um, another joke. No one laughed at that one. I get one of those a week. <laughs> but then you have Rufus. And look at his mom. Paul said his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. I want to speak to older people in the room. Dads and moms. Man, when you love someone enough who's not even your own kid and they speak so highly of you for years and years and years like she was like a mom to me raleigh is such a migrant area like you never meet anyone from raleigh and if you do they're lying there's no one who was ever born here i don't think you never meet anything from raleigh cat you were not <laughs> but with all of these people here who do not have family close what an opportunity it is to bring someone into your home and care for them. They're like a dad to me. They're like a mom to me. We moved here, didn't have anything or anybody, and they cared for us in great ways. And that's what Rufus's mom did for Paul. But if you look at all of this, we're starting to see a theme. We have families who serve together besides married couples, besides single couples, besides singles, besides teens, besides children. You had old, young, and all around were serving together. So the entire church, no matter their lot, no matter their relationship status, no matter if they had kids or not, they were serving Jesus and serving in the church. And it was just an absolute, uh, amazing and inspiring thing. And most of them had a past. And most of them weren't from any kind of money, and they weren't from any kind of status. Verses 14 and 15, we get some quick hitters here. It says, greet Asenotis, Asenokritas, not these names, whatever. It was a slave name. We don't know much about him other than he was a slave. Phlegon, also a slave name, but we know something about him through other writings. He actually became an elder in the church of Marathon in a few years, which was, you know, a little ways away from, from Rome, and he was killed for his faith during the great persecution. But he started as a slave, and he followed Jesus. Hermes, one of the most common slave names. Patrobus, also a slave name. Hermus, no idea who this was except you guessed it. He was a slave name or a former slave. And the brothers who are with them. 
Verse 15, greet Philogus and Julia, slave names, but probably husband and wife. And so even though they, they were poor, even though they didn't have anything, even though they worked sun up to sundown seven days a week, they still served the church in the evening. Nurses and his sister, poor sister, she was probably the youngest. She never got, or maybe she was the middle child, I don't know, but she never got any attention. She almost made the Bible. Nurses and his sister, brother and sister serving Jesus together. And Olympus, we know that he was killed in 69 AD in Rome because he was a Christian. And look at this, and all the saints who are with them. And so you have more people from varied pasts, mainly from poor at this point, and they served God, some of them to death. Verse 16 says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Hey, oh, you know, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Now, the holy kiss, we, we get the ancient Middle Eastern culture, and even today's culture, a greeting is with a kiss on the cheek, you know, normal. Uh, we do the, you know, bring it in, bro hug, pat three times on the back, never make eye contact if you're a guy, you know, we get that. I, you know, I was sitting there when I was writing this, I don't, I realized something, I don't know how, ladies, how do you all greet each other? I don't even know. Do you hug? I know you don't do like the, the bro hug, like, yeah, lady, you know, you don't do that, okay. Yeah, maybe you should. But I love how we, this ends. All the churches of Christ greet you. Do you know that as our new church, we're just over a year old, we have a lot of churches who are rooting for us. Uh, in the elders meetings at Marengo Christian Church in Marengo, Indiana, uh, tiny church, a tiny town, declining town in my home county, um, three, 400 people live in the town, no stoplights, nothing, as poor as can be. In their elders' meetings, they pray for our church. They pray for us. And they pray for you all. Yeah. We, we've been praying for Renew Christian Church. It's going to start up in Durham. We gave them money. We gave them a soundboard. You know, we, their pastor and I meet together. And maybe that's something, you know, I was thinking about this this morning. Maybe this is something that we can, we can do on the weekly emails. Y'all get the weekly emails? Anybody, everyone raise your hand. Anybody not get it? All right, good. No one's a sinner. All right, everyone gets the weekly emails. Maybe this is something we can do. Every month, we just put a church on there, and we're going to start praying for another church. We're going to start praying for another church. Because all the churches of Christ greet you. To read that when you're in a hostile situation, as these Christians were in Rome, they weren't being killed yet, but it was getting sketchy. But to read that and think, wow, they care, and they're thinking about us. It's huge. Because there's something special when churches are in contact with and rooting for other churches. And so maybe that's something we start to do. Now, you would think, wow, man, what a nice way to end this letter, Paul. Just on a high note, all this encouragement, this has been, been great, how sweet. But this was the Apostle Paul. He didn't roll like that. You know, because with all this encouragement, he's like, okay, you know, you're encouraged enough. Let me give you some warnings. You know, you have to have this final warning uh, because there's some things that are very important. And after taking a section of showing how this should work and how this should be, when it doesn't work that way, when the people in the church are, are narcissists or when the people in the church have agendas or personal vendettas, when things, when people in church are mean and evil, you need to be careful and watch out. You see how this works. Now, when it doesn't work this way, there's some things that we need to do. Look at what he says in verse 17. He said, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that which you have been taught. Look at these last two words, avoid them. It's like, wow, Paul, we were flying high for a little bit. But Paul, he gives us uh, some people to watch out for, and I, and I think it's really, really important. And the first group that we need to watch out for are people who teach doctrine that is contrary to Scripture. Doctrine, what I mean, is, is what the Bible teaches. And when they teach something that is not scriptural, which happens all the time in the name of Christ, and how we can uh, address that and know that as we simply know the Word of God and we surround ourselves with people who know the Word of God to help us protect us from that. There are things in Scripture that certainly lie in gray area or ambiguity, and we can have different opinions on some things. We get that. But in the things that affect whether someone is a Christian or not are drawing someone to a lifestyle that will drag them away from the faith and drag them away from Jesus, <laughs> avoid them. Because that's not how it's supposed to go, and it's not going to be good. 
So people who teach doctrine that is contrary to Scripture, be careful. The second one are people who are intentionally dangerous. What I'm talking about are people who are self-righteous and unteachable. That they know it all and they're going to tell you all about it and, and there's nothing you can do to, to sway them uh, because they know all the answers even if they're wrong. So be careful of the intentionally dangerous. Be careful of the unforgiving and the unhealed. Those who aren't willing to give anyone any grace. Those who aren't willing to give anyone any, any, any rope for, for making mistakes or, or, or falling down or, or having something slip through their cracks are, are those who are unhealed, meaning that they'll never let things go. And, and, and when those who are unhealed, they'll wreak havoc on their lives because they're hurting so bad. And there's a statement that cannot be more true. Hurting people hurt people. And so be careful. Certainly want to reach in and try to help, but hurting people hurt people. The next one that is, is simply this, those who are driven by fear or anger. Someone who is always afraid or always you know, trying to make others afraid or is always just seems to be angry. Man, I used to be that person. I can remember being so angry at all kinds of different things in the church, outside of the church. It never ends well. So driven by fear or anger. The next one is those who are always offended. That you can't do anything, and you're like you're walking on eggshells because you never know what's going to happen. Those who are always offended. Sometimes we need to be offended, but not always. Relationally cunning is the next one. Controlling, demanding, domineering, flattering, covert. They talk behind people's backs, and they try to draw people to themselves. Are those who create obstacles those who make it difficult and hard for people to come to Jesus and to grow in Jesus. Be very wary. And as a matter of fact, Paul says, Paul says, avoid them. You see, church, there are times when we have to hit the block button on people in our lives. There are times when we have to hit that block button. You know, and, and, and can they be redeemed by Jesus? Absolutely. But we're probably not the ones to do that. And that's okay. And that's okay. Verse 18, he goes on, he says, For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts, the naive. You see, it is so important that we know the word of God and it's so important to have a church family that watches out for each other. So church, watch out for each other. So church, get into the word of God and, and know it, and know it. Verse 19 goes on and says, For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to look at this, to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. Be wise to what is good. Look, we're, we're not gullible. We're not less educated. We're not irresponsible. We know what is right because we stand on the word of God and the things that are outside of that and things that are causing havoc and, and, and division and, and, and pain and hurt and sin, we, we stay away because we're wise to those tricks. Even though they, 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 they look great and they feel great and it's what we want, we're wise to those tricks. We stay away from it, and we're innocent of, of evil. And so a good way to put that is simply this. Stop doing bad things. <laughs> Be innocent of evil. The things that God said is sin, he said it for a reason. Stay away from that. Stay away from that. And when this life is hard, and it seems like sin and sinfulness and, and, and disorder is winning the world. I want you to hang on to this promise in verse 20. It says, look at this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The God of peace will soon crush Satan. It's like, well, I wish you would hurry up because this is hard. I wish you'd hurry up because I know I'm going to go home and, and they're going to have those same temptations, whatever. I, I wish you'd hurry up because I know there's people in my life, they're, they're just pulling me and dragging me away. I don't know if I can stay strong. I wish he would hurry up. We see what we have to understand. <laughs> Our 75 years on this earth is only a drop in the Pacific Ocean compared to eternity. This is over and it won't even matter. So hang in there. 
Be like Apelles. Hold on to that rope. Be like those that Paul said, oh, you know, I'm, they're beloved and, and they've done great things and, and they've worked so hard. Be like that. Don't be like those that we're told to avoid. And that's our challenge. We're going to come to the time of response for our service. And maybe today is the day to say, you know what, I, I've been living a certain way and, and I just need to, to change what I am doing and, and, and I want to be listed among those names that, that just like what, what Paul wrote about, and, but I, I wouldn't be now if, if this was the end. Maybe this is a time to, to put your faith in the action. We have two lamps on either side of the stage and around those lamps there'll be some of our, our prayer team who are absolutely awesome people. So if there's something that you would like to pray about, something you need help with, or if you would like to make a decision to follow Jesus and be baptized into him, go to one of those lamps. We're gonna have a baptism in a few minutes anyway. It's already full, I see it. The water's warm. We have clothes, we have towels, we have everything that we need or that you may need. We don't have to wait. The thing about coming to Jesus and being baptized Sometimes we might think, oh, I'm just not good enough. That's the point. That's the point. It's not, I need to change, then I can come to Jesus. It's come to Jesus and he will change you. That's how this works. So if you are ready for your life to change, today could be the day. Memorial Day weekend, today could be the day. So simply go to one of those lamps and we would love to start this journey with you. If you need prayer, or just need help with life. They would love to hear your story and pray with you. If you need to confess sin, it is a safe place because they've all sinned too, just like the rest of us. It's a safe place. On either side of the stage, right up against it, we have two stations set up. We take the Lord's Supper uh, every week here, and we ask that everyone participates in it, and we do it this way. Everyone comes forward, uh, just come through the middle aisles and go out the outside, and just as you're coming forward quietly, um, remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. Maybe this is a great time to confess sins of the week. Like, oh, I, I messed up here, here, and here. God, will you, I just give this to you. I confess this to you. And we know that you're faithful and just. And when we confess it, you'll, you'll forgive it. And we, we get that. Maybe that's your time to come forward. And as you get to the table, there's two cups. The bottom has the bread that represents the body of Jesus. The top has the wine or the juice that represents his blood. That was our payment for our debt of sin. So take and eat and drink and remember. But take this time seriously. You can take all the time you need. Don't just brush through it or breeze through it. But simply come forward and take of the Lord's Supper. There's two boxes on the tables if you want to choose to worship through giving, of which we have been asked to do. You can do that as well. You can sit and pray. You can stand and sing. You can go to one of the lamps if you have a decision to make. The church, we just read through this letter that describes this ancient city that mirrors our own culture. So let us be holy in this broken world. God, we love you. And we trust you and we thank you. just ask that you help us to follow you with everything that we have. Father, may we be a people who serves you in, in, in mighty ways. May we be people who strives uh, to help others. May we accept the grace and the help when we need it. And may we, on the other side of it, help those in need as well. God, we know that you are good. Pray if there's anyone here who needs to make a decision to follow you. That they do that. That if anyone is outside of your will and in baptism, that they take care of that. Father, may this be the day that everything changes for somebody. God, we love you and we trust you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Right, y'all can be seated. Hey, this is David. Everyone say hi to David. Hi, David. Uh, David comes uh, believing that Jesus is God's son and is uh, died for him, is returning, died for his sins, and would come back to get us. And so he comes today uh, to be baptized and in obedience as we've been taught through Scripture. And so, David, I'm going to ask that you repeat after me. Remember, you got to hold my hand because it's how we roll here. All right. Uh, I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And He is my Savior. And He is my Savior. And He is my Lord. And He is my Lord. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for David and his heart of just wanting and desiring uh, to follow you in every way possible. God, we thank you for his life journey. That even though it's been hard and difficult in seasons like all of us, uh, he's holding on to that rope and not just holding, he's climbing it. God, we thank you for David, and we thank you for his life, and we thank you for what he means to us and, and what he means to you and your kingdom. God, we give you praise for this day, and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All David, because of your belief in Jesus, that he is God's son, and your confession of faith, and I'll baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning sing that together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. 